us for the Joy Conference yesterday. Boy, what a treat. Yeah, it was phenomenal. It was powerful. The breakout sessions, and you are in for a treat this morning because one of our speakers from the breakout and from the conference yesterday, Pastor Jim Wiegand from Freedom Center in Fenton, is with us this morning. You are going to be delighted. Yeah, right? Oh my goodness. I, somebody was in his breakout. I, that's fantastic. Pastor Jim is a senior pastor at Freedom Center. Together with his wife, Dina, and their two sons, they've enjoyed serving God and his people through an expression that is unique in discipline that gives people the tools that are required to disciple their neighbors. And what I love about this particular part of your bio, Pastor Jim, is it says, so that they can be released into knowing the joy of fulfilling their purpose. And I feel like joy is just kind of a theme that we're kind of camped out on this weekend. So would you help me welcome warmly Pastor Jim Wiegand. Oh my goodness. So kind, so kind. I, uh, I think I've done everything right. There it is. Okay, good. I, I'm taught um, that, that the worst thing I can do right now is begin with a complaint. But can I start with a complaint? <laughs> I, have, I have my chief complaint with this church is that your worship team is here and not in Fenton. That's my complaint. <laughs> I, I am just loving... The, the every time someone, it's their turn to lead a song, I go, oh, that's really, oh, she's really, oh, he's really, you know, I just, man, come on, you know? <laughs> so you guys are blessed. Do you know that? <laughs> and I also know that uh, your, your senior pastor and his bride are, again, just world-class, world-class leaders, and I'll bless you right there. I don't know what you did right, but God has answered somebody's prayers. And now the potential that resides in this place, I just can't tell you. I don't, how many of you guys have been in this church more than 20 years? You've been here more than 20 years. How many of you guys have been here more than 30 years? And you can still hear me. I don't know. 40 years. Come on, raise that saggy skin. There it is. I love it. What, I, what I'm saying is, like, you get the faithfulness, and you would know that what I'm saying is true. I feel like I'm standing on the bridge of the enterprise. And, and James T. Kirk, who... Those are younger than John Luke Picard of my generation. Um, I, I feel like I'm sitting on the bridge right now in his chair. It is such an honor. I was praying over the, the, the room earlier today, and I walked down that aisleway, and the thought occurred to me, how many people have walked from that balcony to this altar and given their lives to Christ? And now I get to stand here? How many guys know I'm the fat kid with glasses who gets packed, picked last in, in kickball? And now I get to preach behind Pastor Brian Pruitt. Come on. He was doing, like, what it, you know, I let me read you the scripture, and he preaches a four-part series. Uh, I'm, 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 I leaned over my buddy Bill, and I said, hey, wh why am I here? He goes, I have no idea why you're here. They, so it's an honor is what I'm trying to say, and I, I hope to do um, not just my best, but better than that with the grace of God today. Can we just pray one last time? All right. Father, I thank you that you have a will, and you've made a way, and uh, play, I, we just pray your blessings upon the Collisons, God, as they enjoy some sunshine wherever they are. Um, Lord, thank you for good leadership. Thank you for good worship leaders and Pastor Kelly and Pastor Naomi and Brother James. I, I sing like that in my dreams. When I go to heaven, I'm going to sing like Brother James, God. And I, I pray that today you take all these ingredients and you produce something that just, it lasts. I, I have no illusions that this sermon will be remembered, but I, I pray that today the meaning of this sermon would become something we live by. Something, a tool, a weapon, something you place in our hands, God, to be effective for you in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. All right, let's, let's do something. Pastor Kurt's not here, so we're going to be really honest. When I say go, I want you to raise your hand when you can name five of something. I'll tell you what it is in a minute, but five of these. And, and, and with some detail, with some clarity. When you can name, and not just here, but any place else, and it's not Pastor Kurt, it's, this would happen in my church as it happens everywhere. When you can name five sermons, name them, that have changed your life, I want you to raise your hand. Marcus said, go, five sermons. Do, 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 ba, ba, da, 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 da. And you guys are glad I'm not leading worship this morning. Da, ba, da, ba. Nobody. Pastor Kurt, if you're watching, don't, please, it's not your fault. But watch this, watch this. 
Now we're going to change one word in that question, not five sermons, but again, the question will be released in a moment. When you can name five of these, I want you to raise your hand. You ready? Not five sermons. When you can name five people that have changed your life, let me see your hand. And the hands go up. Oh, I wish it was the altar call. You'd all get saved. It'd be wonderful, right? What's the point? The point is this. I have no illusions that the sermon I'm about to preach will be remembered. And the goal, God bless you, the goal, I have ADHD, by the way. I don't suffer from it but everybody around me tends to, sooner or later, just, just so you know. Um, the goal of today is not to preach this world-changing sermon, but for you to understand that who you are is always more important than what I say. That we can't name five sermons. We probably can't name five lectures, but we can name five teachers. It was never the curriculum. It was always the Sunday school teacher. It was, it was never biology. It was always the professor that taught you biology. It was never the pastor's sermon. It was always the pastor. It was always the leader. It was always the servant. So today, I want to I just help you, if I can, with a few words for a few minutes to help you understand that the sermons we preach loudly with our lives will echo in eternity. So today, let's, let's not worry about preaching the five greatest sermons. Let's figure out how can we be on someone else's five people that changed my life list. Does that make sense? So open your Bibles this morning to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. We're not going to put that on the screen quite yet, but I want to set this up for you in such a way by digging a foundation with a couple of things. Number one is this. I want you to, these are five truths, and I say truths. I'm going to put a small T on top of truth, but I do believe these statements are true. And number one is, is this. Everyone has a why. Say it with me. Everyone has a, everyone has a why. How do we know this? Because Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10 says this. It says, we're God's workmanship. We're his handiwork, some translations say. The original word is poema. We get our English word poem. We are God's rhyming, rhythmic, cadenced, perfect expression. We are the word that as well as Jesus has become flesh and dwells amongst people. And we are the ones that God said in this generation at this time with who you are and what you've been through and what he's done in your life, you are a quarter inch wrench facing a world full of quarter inch nuts. Then that explain your in-laws? They're just nuts that were the right nuts, right? What I'm saying is this, that we are God's workmanship. We're created in Christ Jesus to do what? To do good works that God prepared when? In advance, before it, for us to do. So understand this. No matter how you got to you, it was not an accident. And I remind you at the end of this message today that God's a God who never wastes anything. The heaven and the hell, the good and the bad, the angelic and the demonic, the times you wept for joy and the times you wept for sorrow. God will not waste a single one of those tears. He is building something because you are the right person in the right place at the right time. And God prepared in advance a work for you. Now, how many of you guys know God didn't create Pastor Brian and then say, you know, if I don't give this guy something to do, he's going to get in trouble. So somebody inflate a pigskin and uh, get a line. Were you a running back or a running back? Oh, I like that. I, was, I played the line. Well, it was flag football. I was five, but it was, it was cool. We, we'll talk later. We'll share war stories. Yeah. I, did, I played because my, my parents, if you did something right, they gave you ice cream. And how many of you guys know I did a lot of things right? <laughs> so, but that, that thought that, that you are not an accident, that you have a destiny, and, I, and I, again, I want to be very, very respectful because I, I understand I'm on the bridge of the enterprise right now, and messages far greater than, than this one have been preached here regularly by Pastor Kurt and his predecessors. But hear me, guys. It wasn't like God made somebody and then had to find something for them to do. Hear me. There was something to do. So God created you to do it. You are a hammer that knows the joy of driving a nail. You are the, the rhyming limerick that makes the poem become something that makes someone weep or, or have joy in their heart. You are the final brushstroke to a masterpiece that God can stand back from and say it's finished. You are, you have a why. God has given you a why. And that purpose was, was created, you were created because of the purpose, not a purpose because of you. Everybody here, well, Jim, that's great, man, but I... My parents made me go to college, and I got my degree, and now I'm an engineer, and I sit in my cubicle, and I CAD stuff, and I count someone else's money, and I'm a housewife, and I'm a, like, please hear me. I don't care what you've been through. I am telling you, God Almighty says through the Apostle Paul that you have a why, and your why is actually greater than what you were doing sometimes, and discovering that why unleashes superpowers. We'll get to it in just a moment. Number two, those who haven't found their why, 
haven't found their way. And, and again, with utter respect, hear me, any Christianity that tells us what to do and what not to do, but never tells us who we are and releases us in meaningful ways to be who we are, will grow to be a growing complaint. And if there's a growing complaint in this generation of kids that were raised in the church, it's, it's not that the songs are bad or the preaching's bad or they don't like the color orange on the pews. It's not our politics. Even though all these excuses are used, let me tell you what it is. Our generation had a, revel had a revelation. The generation before me had a revelation. Let me, let's go back far enough so we can't offend anybody because they're all dead. The holiness movement of the turn of the century, people had a revelation of the holiness of God. And because of that, they took their earrings out. They, they, they quit wearing makeup. They reset their face to factory settings. <laughs> they wore dresses down to the ground and sleeves because if a man sees my wrist, he might lust or whatever it was. But they were, it, was, it wasn't because of legalism. It's because they'd experienced the holiness of God and they said, we can't live the way we're living and we can't wear microphones that fidget on our face. We have to change because he is so good, let's be like him. But how many of you guys know that generation's revelation became the next generation's regulation? Because God hadn't spoken to their kids about skirts. And when they went to school, no one was wearing skirts down to the Amish length. And, and, and maybe the barn didn't need to be painted, but come on, everybody else paints the barn, let me paint the barn. And what about earrings? So they all kind of left the house and did their thing, rebelling against a regulation that didn't have a person of revelation in Jesus. Does this make sense? Well, what happens to the grandkids? They have no idea why they don't wear makeup. They have no idea why skirts have to be a certain length. They, they don't even have a relationship with the people who did. So hear me, any Christianity that tells me what to do and what not to do, but fails to help me understand who I am and then releases me in meaningful ways, there's gonna be a growing discontentment against that type of Christianity. Does that make sense? I can see I'm saying, you know, the problem with this, and we got to vote, and we got to, ha, 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 amen. <laughs> but the kids are in the back row coloring on the, on the offering envelopes going, I wish there were a God who could meet me right where I am. And so this is a message for the younger generation, but let me tell you something, this message, this message is for everybody. If you don't know who you are, God's got a revelation for you, and we hope to find it this morning. You still here? Come on. Third thing is this, God has hidden the clues of our why, and he did it in a brilliant place, a place you'll always have with you. You. There are certain things you do and don't do, certain things you like and don't like, certain people you're attracted to and certain people not so much. Right? There, there's certain cultures, certain foods, certain, and God has put inside of you this DNA, this spiritual DNA, this, these ingredients for his recipe for your purpose. And when you know those things, when we can connect those dots, God begins to lead us. And now Christianity is not about what I do and don't do. It's about who he's made me to be. And I get the joy of driving a nail. I get the, the joy of being the Phillips head thing. How many of you ever tried to drive a, a Phillips head with a regular head screwdriver? What's the joy in that? You ever try to hang a picture with like your wife's shoe as the hammer? Listen, the wall don't like it, the nail don't like it, and the shoe don't like it. But, but the, the picture got hung. How many of you guys know we can do better than that? So when we know who we are, we go from recruiting nursery workers to releasing people that love babies. You see how the church has changed? So finding this out is important. You still here? I'm, I'm not insecure. I just like feedback. Is this, this is being video recorded, Pastor Naomi? Is that right? Okay. Used to be when the pastor wasn't, like back in the old days, we just had cassette tapes. How many of you guys are old enough? Come on. You're like, old enough, we had scrolls. I get that. I get that. But I, I, used, to ha I used to grab a hanky. And every time I leave the hanky, I tell the whole church to amen really loud. The pastor would say, man, how'd you get the people to respond? It's like, I'm just a better preacher than you, Reverend. I don't know, you know. But now that he can see me, video ruined everything. That's all I'm saying. Fourth truth, those who find their why and live from it, man, do they get to live an abundant life. And those who don't will waste the only life they're ever going to get from God. Um. As a pastor, one of my responsibilities is to be there with unanswerable, the answers to unanswerable questions when people pass away, to hold their hands, whether they're children or their parents or their grandparents or great-grandparents. And in that room, you, you kind of get accustomed to that moment where people say the last things they'll ever say. To this day, 35 years of full-time ministry, to this day, no one has said to me, man, I wish I had taken more overtime at the plant. At the end of our life, the regrets that we will have, if we have any at all, will all have to do with our regrets about our relationship with God 
and a relationship with people. Do you, do you see that as a clear kind of understanding? So here's the thing. When, when we are in this position of finding our why and living from it, I promise you, when you know who you are and what God's called you to do and what you have a gift to do and what you'll succeed at and be blessed at and have the anointing on, I promise you that you'll arrive at that like someone sliding into home base, going, it's good to be home, rather than somebody getting thrown out at first base saying, what's the name of this game again? Is it wiffle ball, softball? All I know is I'm bleeding because you weren't supposed to slide in the first base. Fifth truth is this. One of the key roles of leadership in the body of Christ is to help people discover who they are and then prepare them and then release them into their purpose. In other words, please hear me. And I know Pastor Kurt would amen this. I know the entire staff would amen this. Their job is not to get you to build their ministry. Their job is to build your ministry. How do I know this? Because Ephesians chapter 6 verse 11 says, God himself, Jesus himself appointed apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. And what are they going to do? They're going to prepare God's people for what? This is easy. It's right there. Good. Yeah, it works, right? So isn't it interesting? The same apostle with the same epistle, with the same audience, with the same author, talks about in Ephesians chapter 2, you've got a purpose. People go, I don't know what it is. <laughs> How would I know? Well, I got good news. God sent apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers, and if I could be so bold, Cub Scout leaders, and worship leaders, and neighbors, and mentors, and tormentors, to help you understand what he made you to be. God is speaking, and if our expectation is to stop drinking, stop chewing, and stop running with girls that do, when we arrive there, we find ourselves holier than we were, but empty, because purpose has not yet been found. Listen, I, how many of you ever heard of a full gospel church? You know that phrase, full gospel? What it used to mean was, you know, we, we preach the gospel of salvation, but we also believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We're a full gospel church. I have a new definition for that. If you believe that the gospel of Jesus Christ, the life, the, the atoning death, the virgin birth, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is only to manage your sin, you're missing the other half of the equation. What did God save you from? Great question, right? But what did God save you for? We, we teach people to pray that have nothing to pray about. We teach people to read the word, stand on the promises. Why do I need promises, man? I got a, I got a union job. Yeah, and the non-union people giggled, and the union people said, you know, cancel. I'm sorry. What's neat about this is I get to leave afterwards. This is fun. My congregation, I got to deal with it. I'm driving somebody else's car, Pastor Kurt, right? So one of the key questions is this, how do, we, how do we discover our why? Let's get to that nitty-gritty of this. How do we discover our why? Years ago, when I was a youth pastor, it was a former life, I had hair, um, I had one chin. Um, I didn't wear irregular patterns to, to hide my physique. You know what I mean? How many of you remember when you could wear a shirt? How many of you, you love spring, winter, and fall, because you can wear something loose, you don't have to suck your stomach in until July. Come on, are you with me? You feeling that? I yeah. actually got an applause. That was interesting. Yeah! Support group. <laughs> Listen, I, I, I remember going on this youth trip where we take about 30 kids, we go skiing in the Apache White Mountains of Arizona, and it was a blast. And, but I, there was this one ski lift that went all the way from the bottom of the mountain all the way to the top of the mountain, and it took 20 minutes. It was the oldest one. It was only a two-seater. They had like six seaters. This was a two-seater. It was kind of like, how many guys have a vacuum cleaner like that, right? Or a mother-in-law like that. You know what I'm talking about? Like it's just it's struggling to go forward. And so we'd sit down on that, and well, as soon as those skis left the snow, I turned to the kid that was sitting next to me in my youth group, all 30 of them at one time or another, during those three days of skiing, I'd say, I run into you at the mall 10 years from now. And I'd say, how are you doing? You're like, Jim, I'm living the life of my dreams. Like, tell me what that is. Because I believe it's my responsibility to help prepare you spiritually for that life, for that dream. And you know what was funny is about 20% about said, I'm going to be a mommy. I'm going to be a veterinarian. I'm going to be a policeman. I'm going to be a fireman. I'm going to be a pastor. I'm going to be a missionary. But about eight out of ten kids looked at me and said, you, ten years from now? Ten years ago, I had to ask permission to go to the bathroom because I was in kindergarten. You want to know what I'm going to be? That's a lifetime from now. I, don't, I have no idea. And so I had these long conversations with all these kids. 
And all of a sudden we say, you know what, really we're only talking about three things. What are the three things that God has put inside of us that might give us the evidence or the clues or the directional evidence that we need to begin to move towards our why at a greater level? And these are the three things that I want to share with you right now. It's this. Number one is passion. It's easy to start, but let me just say this to you. If I were to sit down over coffee with you and say, what are you passionate about? And you, you can't say Michigan beating Ohio State. I'm, I'm passionate about that, but unless God's called you to be a bookie, probably, probably not your thing. It might be Sal's thing. He laughs pretty hard at Ohio State jokes, but it's not, it's not my thing, right? So what, what are you passionate about? And listen, because when, when, when you ask that question to anybody, and you should do this on the way home with anybody you came with, hey, honey, what's your passion? Hey, honey, what's your passion? Like, like to have that conversation, to understand, because God has hidden this, this passion inside of us. And just like your fingerprints are different, just like your irises are different, just like every snowflake is different, you are different in your passions. Now, how do I know what I'm passionate about? Like, come on, when you're done doing what you have to do, what is it that you really want to do? My old man was a wonderful guy, atheist, he was a drunk, but he loved me the best he could. And he was an engineer for Ford Motor Company. He went to school, and he didn't want to. But his brother was going, and he was going, and, you know, parents were bankers, and there was expectations of a college degree. And so he went off. But you know, when my dad got done doing what he had to do, you know what he wanted to do? He took off the suit and the tie, poured himself a scotch, and he went to the backyard in Bloomfield Hills. I'm from the mean streets of Bloomfield Hills. And he landscaped the most beautiful backyard you've ever seen in your life. He hand-built stone walls and planted annuals and perennials and knew all the Latin names. And he dug a pool. He expanded the driveway. He, why? Because my daddy was probably supposed to be creating something besides cars. And I think one of the reasons he was so miserable and why he drank himself into the stupor that he did is because he was so miserable with his living that it actually began to affect his life. I, I worked for General Motors. I was a fork truck driver. And um, when I retired from that position after two weeks, <laughs> no celebration, no cake, no watch. I was shocked. It was during deer hunting season. Remember deer hunting season? Remember the years ago when I got reworked the, the car, build the cars during deer I learned something that year. Don't buy a car built during deer hunting season. That's, that's what I learned. It's like, I think it goes, just the line's moving. It'll be fine. We'll figure it out. And I... I remember pulling into this clean parking lot. My wife had to be there early because she was in the, I had to be there early because I was the fork truck driver that had to get it there. She was in the finesse department, so she, she, had to, she had to come out late. So we had to be there early and I had to be there late. And this beautiful, I mean, it must have been football fields of just blacktop pavement around the Lake Orion plant down there in Clarkson. And I, I remember uh, it was all clean. It was, it was dark. It was cold. But I remember going into that. And then at lunchtime, everybody kind of go out to their cars to eat their lunch. And then at the end of the day, I had to sit in there as cars left. And it was funny. It turns out that there wasn't a lot of eating going on in the parking lot. But there was a lot of drinking going on in the parking lot. I said, Jim, why, why, do, you think, why do you think everybody came out to drink their lunch? And it wasn't like a, a beer. It was like a pint. There were glass bottles that somebody would take that would last them a week. It lasted them enough to do their afternoon shift. Why is that? Because I, I'm not saying there's anything dishonorable. I'm not. I'm not making fun of it. I'm not. My granddaddy was in the sit-down strike in Flint in 36. He was in UAW at Chapter 1, and I'm proud of that old man. Come on. So this is an anti, I'm, this is not at all. I, I love it. But let me say this to you. I think a lot of people that did a job, their living became their life, and their life was miserable. Because they were, they were born for something else. They're created to do something else. So what are we going to do? As we leave the snow today, I'm going to ask you these three questions. What's your passion? What are you passionate about? If you're not passionate about building a car, are you at least passionate about feeding your family? Are you passionate about serving your community, working in your church? There's got to be something in your life that tells you a little bit more about who you are and what you're created to be. Does this make sense? Second one is this. What's your pain? And you'll learn a lot more about yourself by answering that question than the first one. What's your pain? What is it that absolutely kills you? If there is something that's on your radar that would never happen again if you had your say, if you were king, if you were president, if you were God, this, this sin, this disaster, this, this lack would be over with. What is that one thing? And, and I'll tell you this, guys. We can talk about passion all day long, and the world likes to talk about passion. No one talks about pain in America. But let me tell you something. The greatest things you'll ever do will not be because you're passionate about them. It'll be because pain didn't give you another option. It'll be because you, you were so engulfed by doing something even if it killed you why, why do people why do people become missionaries it's like I, probably for the money and the fame 
What, why is anybody still a school teacher? You know, money, fame. Why would anybody want to be a police officer? You know, money, fame. A firefighter. Listen, you, you might be passionate about putting out fires and the big thing and the spotted dog, but it isn't passion that makes you run into a burning building. It's pain. When you hear somebody inside going, help me, and you know that by running into that building, you run a good risk of hurting yourself, if not dying. You're not going in there because you're passionate about putting out fires. You're running in there because you can't not do something about what they're going through. And you've encountered a meaningful moment. I used to be a cop. I used to be a combat soldier. I, 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 and I'm telling you this. The greatest things I have ever done and the greatest things I will ever do. When, when I am courageous, when I am noble, when I am sacrificial, it's not because I'm passionate. It's because I can't not do something because it's breaking my heart. Let me ask you this question. The Good Samaritan, you guys heard the story? What, what made the Good Samaritan good? When he saw him laying in the road, he had what? Compassion on him. And moved with compassion, he moved him. The priest and the Levite who came before him, they saw the same need, the same time, but their heart wasn't broken by what they saw. The Good Samaritan superpower and your superpower come from understanding God has given you a pain that is actually his. And he's invested that inside of you that you might do what he would do when you encounter it. If your heart doesn't break for youth, get out of youth ministry. Your heart doesn't break for, for teaching kids. Don't be a school teacher. Your heart doesn't break. Like you are missing one of the most beautiful, vital parts of life. And Americans are so prone to turn the channel, take a pill, move away. And God is calling us to engage the pain of our generation. Years ago, I, I was, uh, where to be, 1983, a lifetime ago, I was a 17-year-old kid that got invited to go to Haiti. And again, from the mean streets of Bloomfield Hills. But then from there, I moved into the back seat of my 65 Buick Electra because I was a homeless addict. And when I got invited to this rock concert, I radically, Jesus changed my life. And one night, I met my creator. Now, I couldn't point him out in a police lineup because I, I wasn't raised in church. My daddy was a drunk atheist, and I was a, I was a drug-addicted drunk atheist, you know, carrying on the family business. But when I met Jesus, man, everything changed. And they said, you want to go to Haiti with us? I'm like, yeah! Spring break, baby! <laughs> you know, the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere, kids are dying because they have diarrhea. People are starving to death. And baby Doc Duvalier is, is the, the dictator holding it mercilessly under his thumb. As the world tries to help, he just big Swiss bank account gets bigger. But nobody's helped. Nothing's really changed in Haiti, by the way, since 1983 in a lot of ways. So when someone invited me back as a man, as a senior pastor seven years ago, they said, hey, do you want to go to Haiti? I said, no, I don't. Why? Because I, I, they're not breaking my heart again for no good reason. I can't help them until the government, until the United Nations, until the, everything I send there, by the time the Connex gets there, everything's been rifled through. There's nothing left but a bunch of clothes. They took everything else of value. They sold it on the black market. And I will not enrich criminals in the hope of helping the poor. I just, I'm done. I'm done with Haiti. He said, well, we don't do that. We do this. And I said, well, this is my objection. He said, that's what we've done without objection. Well, this is, my, this is what we do. But you're just giving them money. No, no, we're teaching them to farm. We're teaching them business. We're teaching them agriculture. We're, 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 we're feeding them. But we're not going to feed their grandparents because it won't be needed anymore. We're turning the nation around. Do you want to go with me? And so I played my trump card. You can say trump card in Michigan. Ohio, they're like, huh? Here, Trump. Euchre, are you with me? Come on, Michigan's game. I say in the next governor election, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to elect, not Trump, that's terrible. I'm going to elect Euchre. That's Trump. That was, it sounded political and it wasn't. Wow. Views expressed by the guest pastor are not necessarily those of this church or its management. I, I approve of that message. Right there. Okay. But I kid you not. I, I said, I will ask my wife. How many of you guys know what that means? It means No. So I went to my wife and I said, hey, I got invited by Convoy of Hope to go to Haiti and I don't want to go. She goes, you know, I think you should go. And I went, I have literally just run out of excuses. <laughs> so they get off the plane in Port-au-Prince and we go to Madame Jeanette's orphanage. And it was there that I encountered something that changed my life, radically changed my life. So a bunch of kids, I, I imagine they live in something about the section, about the size of the section, probably 70 kids. There are beds, there's two levels, there's it, the, the stuff from the earthquake has been reused, and so the water, every time it rains, leaks all over their beds. It smells like mildew and sweat and waste, and Madame Jeanette's doing the best that she can with what she has. And in that, I, I came across a child that was about that big. She was sitting on a bench, so that's her butt, that's her head, and little legs. 
and she is malnourished to the place where she's going to die. And I, I sat down next to her on that bench because you don't just walk up to a starving child as a giant white guy and go, hey, I'm a tourist, selfie with a poor kid. So I sat down on the bench in the shade next to her and I just started moving my hand. Her, She was kind of stabilizing herself and she was rocking back and forth and she was very, very sick. And I just hand a little farther, hand a little farther until our pinkies touched. And I just left it there. And when that happened, <laughs> she put her hand on top of my hand. And I turn towards her, and she turns towards me with one of the most gut-wrenching, um, hollow, terrifying looks that a child can give. And I put my second hand out to her, and she lifted her hands up to me, which is a great honor. And I picked her up, and I put her in my arms. And um, every time you go to an orphanage, you've got to bring candy. So over, over in this area of the orphanage, it's like seagulls on a bread factory, just stuff's flying we're throwing candy, but I'm holding this dying child in my arms. And I, I walked over, and we waded through all that, and I grabbed one Skittle. Not a Skittle. The, the square Skittles. Starburst. Starburst, thank you. Man. I don't know the end of the scripture, but I know Starburst. I know it's a section right here. Like, I had no candy. And I took, I unwrapped it. And remember, she's, she, like, I can't give a child a piece of candy. She'll die. So I nibbled a little bit off. I pulled it out of my mouth. And said, that's gross. The cleanest thing in Haiti is the inside of my mouth. And I put that in her mouth, and she just put it there, and, she, and all of a sudden it starts to melt. And, and she, she looked at me, and I looked at her. And we had a moment that wasn't desperate. I chewed off a little bit more. Over about 20 minutes, maybe I gave her a tenth of a starburst, just enough to kind of get that sugar, but not, not hurt her. And she fell asleep in my arms. And when she did, she peed all over me. <laughs> and... Uh, and I fell in love. I fell in love with a dying child in Haiti. And something inside of me that wasn't passion, I promise you, it wasn't. Something inside of me that broke. I just said, that's it. That's all I can stand. I can't stand no more. I came back to my church. And how many of you guys know that when you close your eyes to pray over your food, it, it, that changes things. Pain, like, I don't want to feel that way. I'm never going to go to Haiti. Stop. Where would Jesus be today? He'd be where he's most needed and certainly amongst the poor. Are you with me? Yeah. Reading the same Bible, right? So I, I came back. I'm standing on the front row during worship, and God speaks to me and says, you're to feed a million children in Haiti. And I walked to the platform, and I, I just boldly, courageously, with great faith, walked up to my congregation and said, God just told me that I'm supposed to feed a million kids in Haiti. And I told him that we would be happy to do that because I don't know how to do it without you. Over the next three years, through Count by Hope, we sent a million meals to feed the hungry kids of Haiti, and we do it every, every week now. It's just a whole disaster and stuff. Now, <laughs> hey, God, hear me. How did that happen? Because I'm passionate about Convoy of Hope. No, I'm in pain because a dying child looked at me in a way that I'll never unsee. And if I'd have said, I don't want to see Haiti, it's too painful, it's too disappointing, it's too hard, I would have missed one of the greatest opportunities to glorify my king. And I'm telling you guys, if you will just not change the channel, or not turn your head, or not make it not your problem. If you will engage in, in what is actually happening in our generation, you will begin to see that God has a purpose for your life that's greater than just what you're passionate about. There's a pain. Thirdly, thirdly, and I gotta go, right? What time are we done? It's 1044, are we done it? Oh, that time? Don't say that to an Assemblies of God pastor. Okay. Bring in the burritos, man. We're gonna do this through lunch. You ready? Third one is this, it's proficiency. Write it down, proficiency. So what thrills you, what kills you, and what fills you? What's your passion? What's your pain? What's your proficiency? You know, some people just like to talk. If you read any of my report cards from childhood, all the teachers marveled at my gift of speech <laughs> while, while they were teaching, generally. And they all said, stop it. What they didn't know what they're saying is that they were trying to stop me from actually being me. I'm not saying your kid talks in class not to beat him. I'm just simply saying this. <laughs> what I'm simply saying is this. We all have gifts. You realize the number one fear of Americans is public speaking, greater even than death, which means the average American would rather be the person in the box than the person talking about the person in the box. So what does that tell you if you have a gift like that that others don't have? You just love this. You're just really in tune with that. You like cubicles and numbers. Well, that, that means you're not supposed to be a salesperson. That means you're supposed to like count 
somebody else's money if not your own. I just love to take things and take them apart. I do too, but I can't put them back together again, and you can. I take electronic things apart with a hammer. Some of you guys like tweak this, do that, program it, and now it's got 40 more horsepower. Who knew, right? Whatever God has given you, he's telling you something about you. What's your passion? What's your pain? What's your proficiency? Put up, put up these three circles, if you would, please, and we'll, we'll kind of see them side by side. Passion, pain, proficiency. I would really encourage you to actually do this. this again, I, I'm, not, I'm not believing that this message is going to be the message that changes your life. What I'm hoping for is that you can apply its truth in a way that you become someone who changes somebody else's life. Where you are on their five people that changed my life list. Look what happens at the next slide. Hit me the ne next slide. When the three circles don't just sit side by side, but they do that, my goal today, my hope for you as a person, as a fellow believer, my, my joy in seeing this church engage this would be simply this. What if you woke up every morning and you were right there? Your passion, your pain, your proficiency overlapping. Let's say you're talking to somebody. Remember, we got to get nursery workers. We need three more mammals, someone who can fog a mirror. Just we need, you know, we just got to have people there. And, you, and so, if, if, you know, we used to do this at our church. Like if you put a kid in the nursery, then once a month you got to volunteer. You know what you get? A bunch of people don't want to be there. And a bunch of kids that know it. I don't care. I'm in the big church. That's somebody else's problem. But it, it was a problem, right? And this is what happened. We started saying, what's your passion? They said, I just like kids. My kids grew up, went off to college. My grandbabies are all the world to me. I, I wish I could have spent my whole day with kids. I'm like, yeah, that's interesting. What's your pain? She goes, you know, I, I see sometimes kids that lack a, a male role model. And I know it's maybe a little unorthodox for a man to serve amongst children, but I, I, that's my joy. What's your proficiency? Well, you know, I'm, I've taught preschool for 20 years. Hmm. I wonder what we could have this person do. Say, hey, I got an idea. What do you think this Sunday you meet me down in the nursery? We'll work a shift together and see if it's a good fit. That, that person, you didn't, you didn't recruit him because you needed someone to build your ministry. You released him into what God has called him to be. And the joy that a hammer feels when it drives a nail is now his. So what's a pastor supposed to do? What are leaders supposed to do? What are people who have been around for 30, 40 years supposed to do? We're supposed to find out who people are and find an expression for that among us or outside of us. Because some are missionaries and some are entrepreneurs and some, you know, work in call centers. I don't care. But we're supposed to be somewhere. Do you see that? We're supposed to be something. Worship team, join me if you would, please. My goal, my goal today is that you would understand that you're not an accident, that you have a purpose, that God has prepared you and it to meet to collide. And if you don't know what you're looking for, you'll say, no, 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 I can't do that because I have bills I have to pay. I have a family I have to feed. I have a, a responsibility I have to do. And we will lead ourselves through this American dream. We'll lead ourselves through someone else's plan for our life, totally missing that opportunity to be the chosen vessel of Christ to our generation just by being who we are. Not manufacturing. Not, not trying to make something happen. Just being who we are. Are you still here? Right on. See, this, this is it. Um, evangelism is leading someone who doesn't know Jesus to Jesus. Does that make sense? But discipleship is leading them to the person Jesus created them to be. And I fear that sometimes as a pastor, I think education, indoctrination, groups, this will do it. No, no. We need to have face-to-face -face conversations about destiny. Jesus' blood has dealt with your history, but now Jesus has a plan for your destiny. What is that? If you don't find it, someday someone's going to hold your hand as you leave this life and go on to the next, never really knowing why you were supposed to have been here in the first place. Or you can slide into home base, baby. Last check you right bounces. <laughs> Gave it all. So my... I'm not your pastor. I'm just, I'm just your friend. I want that for you. Is that a selfish thing for me to say? I want that for you. Why don't you wake up in the morning and go, good morning, Lord, instead of good Lord, it's morning. <laughs> and that's what happens when you know who you are. You know what I don't have to do? I don't teach people how to pray when they know who they are because they got a lot to pray about. I know this. If you're called the junior high schoolers and you don't have a wonderful program prepared for them, they have a wonderful program prepared for you. And if that ever happens to you, you never come back in that room unprayed up again. 
If your words don't communicate to the people you love, you'll find a new way to say it. You'll find a new scripture to illustrate it. You'll, you'll light your hair on fire, break bricks, tear phone books, and blow up hot water bottles. How? Because I, I just got to reach you, whatever I got to do, because I pray for you and I love you, because my life is to serve you. So friends, I'm done. Let me show you what it means when a somebody got pastor says, in conclusion, absolutely nothing. So as I continue to close, which is a nice way of saying I don't know how to land the plane, I just want to do this. You stand your feet. Nobody leave. If you leave, I'm writing down your name, and, and, and uh, I'll, I'll make sure your name gets put in for deacon next time just to punish you, just to make sure. Say, Jim, thank you for this talk about purpose, and maybe one day when my life is in hell, I'll think about it, but right now, I'm going through it. No, no, no. Hear me. If you're going through hell, let me introduce you to the king of heaven. If you're going through hell, let me introduce you to the king of heaven because he's the one that takes all these dots and all these broken pieces and all these shards of all of our stuff and he creates a mosaic and a picture of what you're supposed to be. I haven't been to college. I'm, I'm an addict. I live in the backseat of a Buick and God points his finger at a 17-year-old kid and said, I choose you. The fat kid who wears glasses that gets picked last in kickball gets kicked, gets kicked, gets picked by the king of kings and the lord of lords. Come on. And all that stuff. So you know what? I have a heart for the, for the fat kids. I have a heart for the addicts. So what's your education to deal with addiction? I've been one. What's yours? <laughs> I've been to college. That's great, man. And we need smart people. Come on. But we need people that have been there and know the way out. I got nothing. I got nothing but Jesus. I started this whole thing, nothing but Jesus. I hope to finish this thing, nothing but Jesus. So if you're not right with God, if you're not qualified, or if you're disqualified from what's in your heart, the gifts and the callings of God are without repentance. He's not changing his mind about you. Don't you change your mind about you. For you to say no to your purpose is listening to the devil and saying amen and ignoring the voice of God. I don't think that's good counsel. You need to say, God, speak to me. Okay, you're supposed to be the president of Zimbabwe. Like, no, nah, I'm not qualified. It's up to him to qualify the elected. It's up, for, it's up to him to give you what you need. Close your eyes all over this room. Let me just do this, and we're going to take this last season here to worship, because I think, I think God wants to do something. I felt this all morning long, that there's not just this purpose thing. There's this pain thing that's inside of you that's keeping you from being you. If you believe a lie, you will live the fruit of the lie believed. But if you believe the truth, you'll produce fruit. And if you're here right now, you're like, I'm not qualified. I'm not worthy. You're talking to the wrong guy. I'm too old. I'm too young. I'm not smart enough. You realize you just quoted like Paul, Moses, Jeremiah. Do I need to say more? You'll be the first person that says to God, please hang up and try your call again or have an operator help you. He's not changing his mind about you, even though you might have changed your mind about him somewhere along the line. So being honest, the God who loves you, who believes in you, God, yeah, God believes in you. And I believe in God. Yeah, believe in the God who believes in you, and you'll be believing in God. Every time I sin, you know what happens? I get to get born again again. <laughs> Bad theology, but I hope you understand what I'm saying. I'm praying. I forget sometimes that I'm praying, and I start lists and texts and podcasts. And I go, oh, this is Jesus' time. I don't go, oh, I'm such a loser. I'm such a bad prayer. I get the opportunity, as it were, to walk down an aisle again and give my life to Jesus one more time. Every hour probably happens 10 times. I turn my life back to Jesus, back to Jesus. I, I'm learning how to walk. I want to make sure if I fall, I fall into his arms, not away from him. If you're here today and you're not right with God, I've got such good news for you. He loves you, believes in you. You're here for a reason. There's a purpose. You're not a mistake. You're not an accident. I'm sorry he did that to you. I'm sorry she betrayed you. I'm sorry they weren't kind to you. I'm, I'm sorry your last church. I'm sorry your last spouse. I'm sorry the company, the college, your mom and your dad. I'm sorry. But listen, we're not talking about them. We're talking about him. He loves you. He believes in you. He's here for you by his spirit. And now will you, will you reach back to him? Final story. Probably true. If you're old enough to remember the Bobolo boat, Cedar Point's younger brother was Bobolo Island. It was an amusement park in the middle of the Detroit River. We go down there for a class, and I remember my sixth grade class, we're gonna go off to different junior high schools, and I, there was this girl I liked. Her name was Tammy. 
I mean, I liked her. I, I, it was probably the first time that part of my heart actually woke up, and I went, wow, she's, she doesn't have cooties. She isn't gross. I liked her. I mean, probably the first girl I ever loved, if you will. And it's the last dance as we're coming back into the Detroit port. We already dropped everybody off in Wyandotte. We're on the, and the DJ says, it's the last dance. It's my last chance. She's going to a different junior high school than I am. I'll probably never see her again. So if you've been waiting, if you've been wanting, if you've been, you know, now is the time to ask that girl to dance for you. Now, at junior high school, remember this, everybody at elementary school, all the boys are on one side of the boat, all the girls are on the other side of the boat because no one knows what to do. And when he said that, I, I got up my 30 seconds of courage and I crossed the deck of the Bobla boat, third level, and the girls started to whisper and giggle because they didn't know who I was walking towards and I wasn't making eye contact because I'd have chickened out if I had. And when I got to Tammy, I put out my hand and I said, will you dance with me? And she said yes. And we walked to the middle of an empty dance floor. And she looked me in the eyes and she put her arms around the back of my neck. And it was only then that I realized I don't know how to dance. <laughs> so I, I put my arms around her neck and we had kind of a Greco-Roman moment of awkward, you know, hug and, and you know, and she looked me in the eye and she said, oh, you don't even know how to dance. And she turned around and walked away and left me standing in the middle of that deck in front of the entire Duck Lake Elementary School. I never forgot what that felt like to be rejected by someone. I just, I didn't know how to love them very well, but I wanted to. The sting of when they don't love you back is, it's unlike any other pain I've ever experienced in my life. God the Father sent his son and in great courage he has crossed the deck of your life and extended a hand to you. And if you thought by grabbing that hand, you're going to have to not cut your hair and not paint the barn and restore your face to factory settings and wear a skirt and give up your career and give all your money and start drinking Kool-Aid and no, no, no. He's not, all he's asking you for right now is you for right now. If you're here right now and it's been a while since you danced or you've never danced with him, He's proposing relationship. That's what he's doing. God sent his son to cross the deck for you, and he's crossed the deck for you today by his spirit. Now will you respond all over this room right now? Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. See, I'm not right with God, but I want to be. I want to dance, man. I want to dance. I want to have a life that means something. I, I, I need to get out of where I am and into what I'm created to be. If that's you, and I come to three, I want you to raise your hand. You ready? All over this room, that's me, Jim. One. Without a moment's hesitation, don't worry about the people around you. They'll figure it out sooner or later that God has changed your life. Two, you're here. It's now. This isn't an accident. I'm not supposed to be here. It's an honor to be here, but, but I'm not supposed to be here. Right here, right now, I want to dance with Jesus free. Raise your hand all over this room. Now is my time. Now is my, my place. I'm, I'm done with yesterday. I'm done with it. I'm done with that. I'm done with them. Give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. Now understand this. Many people have raised their hands. I'm just going to simply say this. I'm not sure we lead people in prayer here, but just right here where you are, by raising your hand, faith has become sight. You've, you said to God, me, here, now, yes. And if you're here right now and you mean that, then this last song says this. I believe that God is able to take all things the good things, the bad things, the hard things, the mentors, the tormentors, and work them together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purposes. Are you ready for this? As Jesus forgives you of your history, now give to him your destiny. And listen, what's my passion, man? What's my pain? What's my proficiency? What am I supposed to be when I grow up? Don't worry about how to monetize it. Don't worry about money yet. Just, just answer the question and let God begin to speak to you what he's been trying to say to you your whole life. You are good. You are good. Come on. God, you're good. Father, I pray for every uplifted hand because it's attached to an open heart. Invade now and with mercy forgive every sin. If you want that, say amen today. Forgive every sin, God. We say amen to that. God, it, fill us with your Holy Spirit. Speak to us our name, what you call us when you think of us, what you call us. God, today, here, now, we give you who we are. We give you who we are. All my life. Come on, would you sing that this morning? All my life. These altars are open. Do you need a time just to kind of make this front of this church an offering plate in which you want to put your life? Like, this is the moment. You don't have to come just saying if you want to, just to spend that time alone with Jesus. You can make where you're sitting right now, where you're standing right now, a plate 
But I understand all your life, he has been faithful to you. And you're going to take your misery, and he's going to birth ministry. He's going to take your mess, and he's going to give you a message. If he can raise Jesus from the dead, he can reverse every curse in which we've walked into. Come on. Sing it now, would you? All my life. All my life. Your mercy never fails. Come on, church. Let me hear it. All my days. All my days. He believes in you. He forgives you. You're free. Now live it. Live it. All my life. like they stole something. All my life. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, oh, I will see of the goodness. Come on, let it build. Let it build. Let it build. He's been chasing you for a long time. Your goodness is running after. It's running after. altar. If you have given your life to Christ, if you have walked across the dance floor and taken his hand, we would love to know that. Take a connect card, fill it out, take it to the welcome desk. We have a booklet we'd like to put in your hand and we'd like to further the conversation. We'd like to walk this journey with you. Don't be in a hurry to leave if you'd like to linger just in the presence. His presence here is so rich. 
this morning. Thank you for being with us, and we will see you soon.